if you just think of a sine wave, just undulating up and down, up and down, the goal is to predict the exact tip top peak of each of those right. arcs. We're going to train. And that's when you're going to train. And if you're like, okay, I think it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, no. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome back to Barbell Logic. This is your producer, Trent. Today we're going to listen in on part two of A Brief History of Programming, covering Zatsiorski's two-factor model or dual-factor model. We're going to jump right into it, but if you haven't already, go back and listen to part one from Monday. And also, if you haven't heard it, I'd encourage you to go back to episode number 197. It's called SRA Revisited, Exploring the Fitness Fatigue Model. Give you a little bit of background on what we mean when we say fitness fatigue model uh, before we get into all the history and the development of the model. So go check that episode out. And in the meantime, enjoy this one. So the SRA curve, the single factor curve, the one factor curve, they look just like. That's right. And you you were going to you were going to ask a while ago, and you didn't get there because we 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 moved on. Does the single factor curve look exactly like the center of the dual factor of the dual factor curve when recovery crosses homeostasis yep. or the or the set point before training. That's right. Is and, the is the cumulative effect of the negative and positive two factors and we and we average those two things out and say this is what performance is, does it look like the the normal supercompensation SRA I, I, graph? I, I think it does. I, I think, think it does too. I think the SRA thing happens, the one factor thing happens, and I think it's I think it's uh, I think it's fractal. Yeah. You know, however you where whatever level you look at this once somebody's actually trained, it looks like this. Right. Uh, whether it's the, the training session, the microcycle, the mesocycle, yeah. or the overall training cycle for the year or even the lifetime of the athlete, probably. Right. right. Um, now, one of the things I think that's really important about this that has been mentioned in our talking through programming and in our programming classes and the master classes and whatnot is that if you're on a, if people start talking about um, this idea of a novice versus intermediate versus advanced, the novices make progress every two days, every 48 to 72 hours, intermediates every week-ish, and advanced every month-ish, right? Right. That What that means is that we hit PRs at however long that is. So it, it takes an intermediate a week to hit PRs, and it takes an advanced lifter a month plus to hit PRs. And my argument would be, no, that's not actually true. What do you think? Well, a given PR... If you're strictly concerned with your three by five squat PR, just that thing, yep. A novice can do it Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yep. Intermediate does it once a week. Somebody else might be more advanced, and it might take them twelve weeks to do it. Sure, but I think you know a given PR, yes, can take months and months. That's actually a good way to say it. So, but if we're talking about one rep maxes or a specific three rep max, you, you pick whatever it is. A, a repeatable PR. The more advanced you are, the longer it's going to take you to set that new PR. Uh, Bet, to, a best, mar best marathon right, time? Right. Marath you can't run a marathon and run an under three-hour long marathon, run it in you know in 258, and then two days later run it in 257. Nope. Can't do it. Or if you did, that 258 wasn't that hard. Wasn't as hard as it should have been. But, right. But we believe that the stress has to trend upwards. And I say trend. Not every single workout has to be more stressful than the last right. one, but the trend has to go up. And so that means you're going to be getting all kinds of PRs all the time if you're doing rational programming that's accountable. Yeah, so even as an advanced lifter who's who's doing potentially a 12-week or 16-week long be, program, which is really one of the longer programs that you're ever going to see, you're still pro that, that athlete is still probably going to hit some PRs Every single week. It might be a, a weird thing like Charity getting an 8 by 3 bench press PR. That's right. You don't know it's, but. But but she had done 8 by 3 before, and she said, okay, I've done 8 by 3 before. My best 8 by 3 was at 190, and this week I did it at 195. Or how about or, or this? whatever. Maybe have only done 7 by 3 
And eight by three is a PR just by virtue they've never because she's you never the, even moved that right, many reps. Or you did the exact same weight for a little more volume. The yep. ton, it's a tonnage PR. But the, what we're looking for there are PRs. PRs are the driving metric for what we're trying to do when we continue to set PRs. Whether that is as a, a, a novice where all the PRs are three sets of five, basically, or an intermediate where maybe some of those PRs are three by five, maybe they're five by five, maybe on Friday it's one by five. The goal is to continue to set PRs. It's a yep. it's about quantifiable metrics, and sometimes that also means that the quantifiable metric is a tonnage PR, is a volume PR. I tell is you, a, the tonnage. That's where I was going. Yeah, it's like if you're tracking the PRs, you don't have to track the tonnage. That's right. You can go back and look and like you know what's their biggest five by five. Well, you, you, biggest five by five is two eighty five. Next time they do five by five, they did two ninety. Tonnage went up. We know it went up. Don't even have to calculate. Right. Don't need a calculator. Or if they did four sets of five at two seventy five, and the next time they do five sets of five at two seventy five, the weight stays the same, but the volume went up. That's also still a tonnage PR. We yep. know because they did more volume. Now we come back to that MED. Those the the basics of those MED principles which is that we choose simplicity over complexity, we choose intensity over volume, and we choose economy over over excess, excess, right? Those things are important. So we don't necessarily, like tonnage PRs, volume PRs, are not the first thing we're going to look at, but they are still a quantifiable metric. So what we don't do is we don't look at RPE PRs, we don't look at uh, one rep max calculator PRs, we don't care anything about the total number of sets and reps that you do. Oh, I did ten. I did. I did ten sets of ten instead of ten sets of nine. Like that doesn't matter yeah. unless the it's weight. It's not the full story. Yeah, yeah. it's a, you, you, right. So there's specificity there, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to increase force production. So underlying all of this for us, at least, is the belief that we're going to have to do a little more work than we did before to disrupt homeostasis, and we're doing all of this in service of driving the performance up. And when you get to an a inter, late intermediate and an early advanced athlete, you're walking the razor's edge of fucking up this dual factor. Sure, <laughs> uh, 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 theory of programming. Sure, although although I still think the dual factor theory of programming is more forgiving than the single factor theory. Of uh, it programming. is the timing is so all that matters razor in crucial. single factor is timing. So think about in single factor if you just think of a sine wave just undulating up and down, up and down. The goal is to predict the exact tip top peak of each of those that's arcs. Right. We're going to train, and at that's the when apex. you're going to train. And if you're like, okay, I think it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, no, it needs to be five fifty three <laughs> p.m. Sure. on Wednesday, right? And then uh, then on Friday it might be a little bit later, right? Or and then again, you, you, you can't wait bit... till Monday. Now it's going to be Sunday that's because right. we got to get our that, intervals that's right. Exactly right. That's exactly right. It, it, it's 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 weird. But it's I far think less it happens. Forgiving. But I, I think it happens, though. Um, well, we could talk about that here in a minute. But the two-factor theory, you've already described what the two factors are. One of them is the performance. The other is the fatigue. I'm sorry. It's really the fit, right? Your, your the, fitness or your absolute performance. Right, like your potential your, performance. Your theoretical yeah. capability, athletic That's right. capability. And then the fatigue. Minus the fatigue equals the current performance. Yep. So, for example... Today, Matt, you squatted, I don't remember what it was. It was a bunch of chains and weird shit. 365 plus 120 pounds of chain. So I think. Let, let's say you did so it's 485. Let's say you, just, you squatted 45. Pretty tired. Right. Pretty fatigued. Pretty triple. fatigued. And if, if we had to go put something on the bar and you had to go do a set of three right now, it would be less than that. Yes. Significantly. Because... The performance, your whatever you're capable of. That's right. All the fatigue you've undergone this morning would subtract from that. Correct. You had less fatigue this morning when you went in the gym than you That's do now. Right. I smashed my finger in the weight room. You smashed the real crap I mean, the out, out of, of it. my finger. It's so it's bad. Purple right now because I dropped a chain, uh, pinched in the uh, carabiner. I've had, I've had uh, two whiskeys tonight. I just smoked a pipe. Right. It's nine o'clock at night. I haven't slept. Right. Like all of those things are there, right? But here's the thing. That two-factor model, that fitness fatigue model, is actually more forgiving for, so today is Saturday. I won't train tomorrow on Sunday. I will train on Monday. Yeah, it, so, it allows you to program for training in the, in the fatigue state. That's exactly right. You can still train before you hit the apex of a super compensation. Like, I don't have to be this 
fuzzy place above what homeostasis or my, I don't have to wait till the baseline increases. So I can still be under fatigue. I can still train and I can adapt training. And by the way, this is why templates don't work very well and why we, why we coach our clients and program our clients at BLOC on at worst a week by week basis, right? So on every, like tomorrow morning will be Sunday. I'll sit down I'll, I'll get an overview again of everybody's training for the week. And, of course, I've coached them on the list and technique all week, every single day. But now I'm going to sit down tomorrow morning and I'm going to say, okay, I can now see a trend coming where I can look at a calendar view of my client and go, okay, my client was – they were struggling a little bit two weeks ago. Last week they struggled a lot. I have got to back off on the amount of stress that they're getting this week in order to let them dissipate some of that fatigue – so that 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 net effect of the positives and negatives becomes a net positive, because what you start to see is a net negative. And and by the way, that's not all bad, right? Having a net negative effect for a short period of time is what is what the the strength and conditioning world calls overreaching. If it can be recovered from and adapted to, it's it's what we call overreaching. I didn't invent this term, right? And if the fatigue is the fatigue is so great that it cannot be recovered from. We can never get back above baseline without like a com- complete reset. That's what true overtraining is. And true overtraining doesn't happen very often Ooh, it's a bad with strength deal. athletes. Now, it, it will happen with CrossFitters. It will happen with marathon runners, with distance run, you know, distance sort of people. But in, in weightlifting, it doesn't happen that often. So, so Zat Siorski says that the immediate training effect of a workout is, one— a gain in fitness prompted by the workout. Obviously, right? And two, the positive, fatigue. The negative. Okay, there's your two factors. And then he says, after one workout, an athlete's preparedness, one, ameliorates due to fitness gain. They got right. stronger. It got better. And then he says, but. And deteriorates. Deteriorates because of the fatigue. That's exactly right. And so there's a curve associated the with that. That's and right. The, and the, the shape and length of that curve is going to change due to the, the magnitude, the, the, the fitness of the athlete, sure. the magnitude of the workout, right. and the advancement of their uh, of their training age. Sure. Now yeah, that's and, me, and, not and, that's and, and just and then the magnitude itself of the actual both, like what is the magnitude of the net positive effect of the workout, and what is the magnitude of the negative effect of the workout? Right. Right. So if if you do a workout and then and one day after the workout, on a scale of one to ten. One day after the workout, the negative is a nine, and the positive is a five. You're at a negative four. You're going to have to get a whole lot more tired before you get a little bit stronger. That's right. And then the next day, your fatigue is not a is not a nine anymore. Now your fatigue is a five, but your fitness improvement or the positive effect is also a five. So on day two, maybe it's a net zero, and on day three, now my fatigue is only a two or two and a half. And my positive effect is still a five. So now I'm at a positive three or positive two and a half. That's the idea. It's the, it's the net between the two factors that matters. So and that's what has to be constantly managed by both the coach and the athlete. The coach can manage that pretty well when it comes to only training. Right. But the thing we have to understand is that the magnitude of the negative effect post-training isn't just from the training. It's also from the lack of sleep. It's from the too much alcohol. It's from the fight with the wife. It's That's from the why we always harp work. on eating. That's exactly right. That's why it's from the not, I didn't get enough. Because you can control your food. Yep. You sometimes can't control the stress at work or the stress at home. Right? Like those things can't always be controlled. But you know what? You can stick a protein shake in your mouth. Now he, he throws out, Zatsy Worski in this article throws, or it's out, this excerpt from the book throws out. Something here that's, I think, a little arbitrary, but it's worth it. It illustrates the thing. He says that the the depth of the fatigue is going to be about three times the magnitude of the gain in strength, and he also says that the strength gain will last three times longer than the fatigue right, did. Right, that's exactly right. Now we know that's a guess, right? It's like, a let's guess. be honest, let's be logical. But it gives us but an what, idea though. Right. What he's saying is is that the the effect of the fatigue, the effect of the of the gain, the gain will last three times longer than the fatigue did. Yep. Now again, we don't actually know, maybe it's two times longer, but what we know is that the positive effect from the training, if the training was appropriate, 
is going to be low in, in, in magnitude, but long in duration. And the fatigue is going to be high in magnitude, but short in duration. So we have to get through the high magnitude fatigue and recover. And that's why we do things like after hard workouts, it's real important to sleep, take an extra nap, eat extra food, eat your groceries, don't fight with your wife, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, and even, and even, and by the way, this is, you want a, you want a religious connotation here? You ever heard terms like, you know, you give me a hard time for being a Calvinist and people talk all the time about Calvinists is that you believe like a Calvinist, but you, you live like an Arminian, right. which means like you live like a free will person. So, so I actually think the training is kind of similar. So you believe like we understand that there's two factors going on here. But you live like super compensation is the thing. Right. So what you do is you make sure you got plenty of food, plenty of protein, plenty of carbs, plenty of salt, plenty of creatine, plenty of rest. And you try to super compensate, even though we know that there are things that are more complicated going on at a physiological level than yeah. just basic super compensation, like substrates. Zat Sigorski tells us there are six training effects here. We have acute effects that happen immediately, intermediate effects the cumulative effects uh that you know these are the these are the effects that the advanced athlete are looking for the ones that take a while to accumulate right. um over a number of training sessions or even seasons of training and then there are delayed effects um you know and those seem to be those can be good and bad yep. you know do your meet on saturday sunday night monday morning ugh, wrecked yep uh partial effects the changes produced by a single training uh, a session and a movement and then residual effects. And we, we have to program to manage all of those things. So right here at the end of this chapter, this is the good stuff. Yep. Um, he, he gives us, he has four little bullet points here. Let me turn on my light so I can read these. Because it got dark. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it straight out. In order to induce the adaptation, the following are required. One, an exercise overload must be applied. Overload has to happen, right? Yep. Nobody argues that. Two, the exercises and training protocol must be specific corresponding to main sport exercise. Okay, so if we're trying to get stronger, the idea is intensity has to go up, force production has to go up, right? If you're running, the length the length of the run has to go up or the time has to go That's down. That's exactly right. So, like, we don't run if we're trying to throw a shot put. Yep. That, that, that's specificity. Three, both exercises and training load, intensity and volume, should vary over time periods. When the same exercise with the same training load is employed over a long period of time, performance gains decrease. Right. You, its accommodation takes place. That's right. Four, training programs must be adjusted individually to each athlete. Remember that all people are different. Now, let's go back to talk about three here for just a second. He says that when the same training load is employed over a long period of time, performance gains decrease. So, there's a corollary to that. Of course. If the loads increase, the performance increases. That's right. Now, if it if it increases too much, you damage the person. They can't recover. Right. We're, we we overreached and we're overtrained. That's right. But three is important, and there are two sides of the the number three coin. There. Yeah. Look, if you've never squatted two seventy five for three sets of five, and you squat two seventy five for three sets of five, it will disrupt homeostasis. Your body will recover, and the idea that it's that what's happening here is your it's it's not that your body is super compensating; it's that it's adapting. Just 275 for three sets of five. If the next time you come in and squat, you squat 275 for three sets of five again, it might not disrupt homeostasis at all. It probably still will a little bit, and you'll adapt a little better, but eventually you can't adapt to 275 for three sets of five anymore. You're not going to still get a training effect out of the deal because you're completely adapted to it. And you act like everybody that's listening to this is like, well, duh. But how many of you guys know the guy that sits down and he's like, hey, as long as I can do 225 for 10 on the bench press, I'm good. Or two tw or whatever it is, right? They have this number. And they go down and they literally, every time they go to the gym, they lay down and they do the same weight for the same number of reps because their idea is maintenance. And we've already discussed, maintenance is a myth. It doesn't really work. See, that's Iorski's law number three. The, so here's the money shot. To plan training programs, coaches use simple models that are based only on the most essential features. Mm. These models are known as generalized theories of training. Boom. It's like he knew what he was talking about. It's like he knew what he It's like he got a whole bunch of people strong one, one time. Uh, <laughs> it's using a simple model based on the 
the least number of variables making minimum effective dose changes. Yeah, it, you know, we we were talking about this crap, and you're like, oh, it seems like he said something about it before Keeley did, and we sure. went and pulled it up. And I've read this, and you've read it, but it was longer for you than it was for me ago. Sure. And I, when when I saw that, I was like, you know, that's what we've been talking about. So I don't know if I got a little confirmation bias there. Sure. But uh, but but. But, you know, but you my experience, my experience bears that out. Yeah, me too. I, I would love for our listeners, if somebody knows of uh, uh, something that's pre nineteen ninety five, so we know Zach Siorski did this. Maybe maybe something that you've seen Bud Charniga um, translate from Russian into English that discusses this two factor theory, this dual factor of fitness fatigue theory pre nineteen ninety five. We would love to see it and hear it. We'll oh, certainly yeah. give you a shout out on the on the podcast. We'd love to read it. Send it to us. Um at what where we want to send it at uh, well send it to questions at barbell yeah, and we'll give you in a the shout sub- out. and in the subject line put put you know two factor theory, something like that. And we'd love to see anything that's pre nineteen ninety five and and probably anything that's pre nineteen ninety five is liable to have been originally written in, in Russian and then since translated, which would be great. We'd love to see that. Like, yeah. I would love to see. There has to be something in those so old Soviet sports reviews. Uh, that would be great. By the way, I would love those. So if, if you're out there and you can get your hands on some old Soviet sports reviews or old Strength and Health magazines, oh, I've got a dollar. handful of those. Guys, we would love those. I, man, I, we'll, we'll make it worth your time if you can find some of those it's, things for somebody, us. Somebody hook us up with Jan Todd. She probably knows the definitive answer. Like yeah, that's when probably the first Terry Todd's wife. So Terry, Terry died earlier this year, and he was kind of the historian that's left. And... Uh, and she's a she. They have a. Is she the one that runs the the museum at the University of Texas? I believe so. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So we're you know this stuff matters. So it'd be interesting to know who the first group of of people were that started thinking about this idea of fitness fatigue. I I it, I don't believe it's in Muscletown, USA about the York guys. And the York guys are pretty smart. I mean, we're talking about Bill Starr and and Suggs and Bednarski and these guys who like really thought about programming and knew what they were doing. But I, I don't know that they really thought about what was the thing that they were adapting to um, here in the Western side. I suspect that if you're doing explosive stuff like shot, you know, shot uh, or Snatch. the Olympic lifts, yeah, right. that that the single factor theory could take you farther in the sort of explosive movements than it could the brutally slow stuff. Where sure. Yeah, it would, be, it would be very hard to throw a shot. If you were going to throw any a shot anywhere near a PR distance, fatigue would need to be almost completely, if not completely, dissipated. Yeah. And you would, you would need to be in this sort of super comp. Everybody's had those days, right, where you've gone to the gym and you, for whatever reason, you just feel great. You feel you feel you feel like not full in your belly, but you feel full like in your muscle bellies, and you feel strong, and you feel everything feels tight, and like you're Matt explosive. Matt loves and everything to feel moves. that bloat. I love the bloat. So I love that bloat. D- does anybody ever program someone to throw the shot to put the shot? Does anybody ever program it to be like throw it halfway today? No, of course not. I mean, they always go all That's the exactly right. way. Right. And by and by the way, I think we. I don't know if I've said. And this, they don't think, throw a, a, a light shot either. They always throw the same shot, the same shot. Right. Always. Right? So, so Bondarchuk was the guy that did this. Anatoly Bondarchuk. Anatoly, I think. Uh, Bondarchuk is the guy that really invented block training, which is what which is what Louis calls uh, conjugate, which is right. not actually what conjugate is, but but it's, a, it's conjugate training, block-styled training, was invented by Bondarchuk, who was the strength coach and throwing coach for the Soviet team. He was the guy that figured out how to use block training in both the weight room and throwing shot in order to get maximum output out of their shot putters, right? And so he was the guy that did that. And, and, and they, they never threw – they didn't throw heavier shots and lighter shots. They threw the shot. And then what they did was they got really, really strong in the weight room and really, really explosive and did things like, like lots of power cleans, lots of bench presses. I mean, heavy, dude. I'm talking about all those guys could bench press over 600 pounds on the international team – for the Soviets, like that, you think about us. How how many guys in the United States right now can bench press six hundred pounds raw? I don't know. It's probably less than ten. Yeah, it's it may be less than five. It's gross. It's low, right? And so those guys did that anyway. It's really interesting. Yeah, so I think with those explosive movements, when you're when you're when you're throwing 
the same shot every time and you're throwing it all out in the in the in the clean and the in the snatch are the same way you either hit them or you don't like it's all out the yeah. weight's different but it's all out yeah yeah the, the 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 one factor theory matters more right so i really think that this is fractal right sure. they need to come in and be fresh enough sure to hit their max effort stuff sure um so you could you, you could sneak by and do a really great job with the single factor theory approach with those explosive movements for a very long time, I think. Right. But when you start lengthening... It would only apply to those explosive movements, right. right? And usually I think what those guys would do is they would come in and they would do their shot putting like in the morning when they were fresh, and then in the afternoons they would do their weight training because it didn't matter if they weren't quite as fresh, like if they were fatigued a little bit from the shot. Where's the that, shot weigh? I don't even know. Uh, is it, I think it's 16 12, pounds. It's not... It's like, it's. like I think it's a kilo version too. I'm, gonna, I'm embarrassed that I... I but it's I, I believe I believe in the U.S. it's 16 pounds. Yeah. So you know that's not going to that's not going to script their deadlift. You know. No, so, and yeah. and they're not. And that's the other thing is that you see this all the time. I saw this in in high school track and field that uh, you know the warm up for the track and field team was to you know to take a mile, run a mile. Right. And so you get all these kids and they're running a mile, and I'm like, whoa, 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 why are the guys away in 285 running a mile? I'm like, well, because they're doing the warm ups with the track and field team. I'm like, stop. Right. They're throwing shot. They should never run a mile. You know, and then the track, oh, it's a team exercise. Fuck no, it's not. Team exercise is those motherfuckers should be eating while everybody else is throwing shot or you, you get while that, everybody else is running their mile. You and get then that they'll, Indian they'll throw girl that weighs 205 that throws and the they, shot. And then they go out there, they make those kids throw a shot sometimes a hundred times in a session. Yeah. And you go in and you look at these Soviets, like those guys are throwing shot. They're throwing 18 reps on the shot, they're throwing 12 reps on the shot. And then they're going in and they're lifting. I always thought the best – I can't fathom a more fun college experience as a college athlete than being a shot putter. Can you, you imagine? It's so way like, – like even the kicker gets creamed every now yeah, and then. Like, and and then you're still, doing two a well, day. Even the kicker still has – right, he still has to go to all the practices. Right. So shot put, you literally go out there and you throw the shot, you know, 20 times or whatever. And you do that probably not even seven days a week. You're probably doing it four or five days a week. And the rest of the time you just train as heavy as balls. And then you and then you eat a bunch of protein. You get to go to that, you know, that athlete cafeteria that's got all the chicken breasts and all the food in it. You get to eat and sleep and get massage and throw shot and lift weights <laughs> and take PE classes. Take PED 100. Right. That's a pretty sweet gig. Yeah, that's kind of what we do. That's hey. kind of what we do. That is from uh, Zatsky, Vladimir Zatsky Wurzis, 1997, Theory and Practice of uh, Science Strength, and practice, strength, strength Science training. and yep. Practice of Strength Training. 95, and SIF, SIF and, uh, SIF Super Training was written in 93 originally, and again, my edition, SIF references that Siorski, but obviously he wouldn't have been able to do so in 93. So if somebody has an original 93 version of, of Super Training, I'd be interesting to see what it says. See if that's um, in the index at or least. Or see if you can find us. I mean, look, I'll, I'll, send you, I'll send you some free swag or something cool. Uh, if you can find us some uh, pre-1995 uh, discussions from anybody about this two-factor theory, dual-factor theory, fitness fatigue theory, all those being the same sort of thing would be really cool. I Love suspect to. it's out there. So this is pages 10 through 15, what we just went over. I hope this was helpful to you guys. I hope it uh, spurred your curiosity on to maybe go dig into some of this stuff for yourself and uh, see what the heck is going on because there have been titans before us all. That's another Barbell Logic podcast. Send your questions and your citations of earlier uh, dual factor uh, work. Uh, to questions at barbell-logic.com and uh, send your questions about this or anything else we've talked about or anything else you're curious about to that same email address and we'll cover that stuff on an upcoming uh, question and answer podcast. Those come out Saturdays. If you guys listen on YouTube, if you're one of the hardcore people that got to the end of this on YouTube, thank uh, you. Thank you. And then put in the comments to tell people to leave it run in the background. Even if they're not going to listen to it all, but leave it run in the background. Let's let's push that watch time up. That's That would be helpful. Helps us with that algorithm. You bet. The and evil algorithm. Go out to uh, go out to uh, iTunes and give us a five star review and, and write us a write us a little review. Those are helpful. People look at those and they seem to be driving the traffic. So yep. thanks to all of you that have already done that. We will talk to you in just a few days. Bye. Thanks everybody.